Hi, how's everyone? So I will be working with Dr. McGrath with the ninth graders. He has with the last name A through F, and I have F through Z. Um, so I'll be working with them. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of them already for the first few days of school and schedule changes. They are a great pleasure. I've heard wonderful, wonderful things about this class, so I'm very excited to work with them. Throughout the next few weeks, the 21st of September and the 4th of October, Dr. McGrath and I will be going into the mentor classes to introduce ourselves. And then from there on out, throughout the next few months, we'll be pulling them in individually to meet them and see how we can best support them. Um, and that is kind of what's going on. It's funny, when I meet some of the ninth graders, they can already explain the job schedule better than I can. <laughs> and this is my first year here as well, so I think sometimes their anxiety decreases a little bit when I tell them that. I'm going through it too. So um, I'm very excited to work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. I'd add one footnote. Uh, this comes from being old having children working with parents here at Byron Mills High School for 11 years, most of it with freshmen. If you're ever concerned about your daughter or your son, even if you can't concretize it, come see Kira or me. I'll call it mother, father, parental intuition. Parents know when something's not right. All the grades may be appropriate. The child may not be complaining about anything. But if you're ever worried, even in the absence of data, don't hesitate to call Kira or me and come in. And we'll talk. And most importantly, we'll partner in the name of helping your child. So one little footnote to that. Now. I'll ask the question for Christina. How many of you are the parents of seniors? Very good. But even if you're the parent of a freshman, a sophomore, or a current junior, you're going to want to listen to the good things that she's going to share. She's going to talk about college admissions for our seniors and their parents and bring you through some very important. So without further ado, Christina Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. And just um, for Kira Leaves, you know, it's been great to have Kira uh, with us because she comes from Mayapac uh, High School and also Rhinec. And so sometimes we sit there like, well, what did you guys do there? And give us, you know, give us that perspective. And she's been fabulous at kind of, you know, giving us a different perspective on, you know, what's, what's done in some other schools. Um, but to kind of give you an update on college, okay? And if you don't have a senior, you will at some point. <laughs> so, and, and this is pretty much a process that we follow uh, throughout the time, you know, that your, your child will be here, okay? So tomorrow is kind of a big day. Uh, first period tomorrow, we will have an assembly for all seniors. Okay, and in this assembly, they will be meeting with smaller groups, okay? So we will each have our uh, group of students that we counsel, okay? And in that opportunity, we're really going to be able to give students the full process of what to expect about the college process, okay? Uh, we've invited all of our seniors to be on our Google Classroom. And this is different than what we've done in the past. Typically, we've each had our own Google Classroom by counselor, and we felt that this year was a really good year to make the Google Classroom available for all seniors so that every senior is getting the same information, whether it's scholarship information or deadlines or just any kind of general information, any of the counselors can contribute to that Google Classroom. At this point, about half of the students um, have accepted that. So um, a good question to your child has, is, have you joined the Google Classroom? And we will be going over uh, with that with the students tomorrow, making sure that they're on there. That's really our main forum for communicating decision, you know, uh, uh, deadlines and important information, okay? 
But the real reason for tomorrow is to discuss the entire college process with your child. So whether your child is ready, they have their applications ready, they are just dying to send them out, or whether your child doesn't even know what the common application is yet and has not written an essay, wherever they are in that uh, spectrum is completely fine. And we're going to work them through where they're at at this point and take them through uh, where they need to be over the next few months. Okay. So we will be giving them uh, kind of the nuts and bolts tomorrow, some things that they're going to learn. How do I formally request through Naviance that my teachers send recommendations to the colleges? They're going to learn that process. They're going to learn the process of how do I request from you as my counselor that I want my transcript and your letter, my letter of recommendation sent to all the colleges. Okay? They will learn how to release their SAT scores and ACT scores to the colleges. Um, and then uh, a, a lot, lot more. And, and really what we want to get across to seniors at this point is if um, they have not had, and none of them have this year, had an appointment with us as their counselor to sit down and go over their entire college list, how they are applying to schools, early action, early decision, rolling, okay, what those deadlines are, it is our opportunity to sit down with our students and go through that, okay? And that has to be the first thing that your child does before they submit their application, before they request teachers to submit letters of recommendation, and before they request a transcript and a letter of recommendation from uh, their counselor. Okay. All of this, um, after we talk to them, will be given to them in a pamphlet and a big packet, so they will have it as a hard copy, and we will, of course, post this on the Google Classroom. So uh, I strongly suggest that if you have questions, to either go to the Google Classroom with your child, ask them for the packet, ask them about the meeting that they had um, yesterday, and from there, if you still have questions, by all means, reach out to us. Okay. For those of you who have children who are mentors, um, or who have peer leader, their training session, uh, we have notified the teachers uh, who teach uh, mentor and uh, peer leader that your child needs to be available and at this meeting tomorrow. They have made other arrangements to work with their mentors um, during this time. So really all seniors should be there. And if for some reason your child misses it, they should just follow up individually with their counselor. At this point, after, after tomorrow's meeting, we're going to be suggesting that a student make an individual appointment with us to go over the whole process. If at that time you would like to have another meeting, by all means, call up the counselor and set that up. Uh, but we would like to have the next meeting individually with a student uh, and get kind of their viewpoint, what's happened since the last time we met in the spring, and bring us up to date. And if at that point you still feel like you would like uh, another meeting, th absolutely, that's what we're doing this time of year. We had two wonderful colleagues, Ann Kaplan and Susan Buckman, uh, retire last year. Um, We've heard from them recently, and we know all the wonderful things that they're doing on their vacation, and I delete that email, because I don't want to see it. Susan in Africa yet? I think she's in Africa, Africa. Yeah. I think Susan's in Africa. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> Susan's, uh, Susan's students have been uh, split amongst uh, Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Carollo, and myself. Okay, So we each have uh, Mrs. Buckman's seniors. And we have met with Susan prior to her leaving, found out what we could about the students. Um, she's written the letters of recommendation for all of her students because she knew them well. And we have the opportunity to edit that letter that will go out on her behalf to the colleges. And for any student who has not met with their new counselor who had Susan last year at this point should request an appointment to meet with their counselor this year sooner rather than later. Okay, because we need to kind of fill in the gaps. We might need to do a little bit more work. 
okay? And if at that time, if you have not met with your new counselor as a family, then absolutely reach out to your counselor and make sure that, that we set that up uh, and so that you feel comfortable about the process. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about a deadline that is fast approaching, and that is October 1st. I believe this is the second year that we, or not we, that the uh, colleges have moved to an earlier filing of the, of, for financial aid. So the FAFSA, which is the free financial aid form provided by the U.S. government, is available beginning October 1st, okay? Uh, also, a college or university requiring more financial inf aid information, more financial information from you, um, may also require what's called the CSS profile, which requires a bit more information. Again, that is not available until October 1st of this year. It would be based off of your 2017 tax return, so that information is already available. If you are applying for financial aid, I strongly suggest, too, that you apply on the earlier side. Okay, October, November are good times to apply um, for financial aid and, and get that in so that your child can maximize on the aid that they may receive from a, a college or university. Along with that is just kind of a, <clears throat> a, uh, a plea uh, to, to discuss with your child about finances, about the cost of college, and if there are constraints on the amount that you can contribute towards uh, your child's education, we, we are hopeful that you are having those conversations prior to your child applying. And I know Dr. McGrath and I have each had a few really tough conversations with parents later in the year, April, May, where a child is thrilled to be accepted to a college or university. And parents are finally getting a sense of how much that's really going to cost. And they've come to us in very much in a panic because they cannot afford to send their child there. And there hasn't been a discussion about that ahead of time. And that is a very, very hard time to say to your child, I know that this is where you wanted to go to school, but we can't afford it. And on every college and university, on their financial aid section of their uh, website, they have to have what's, what's called a net price calculator. It's a very quick form that you would fill out with your financial information and you would get a rough estimate of what you would be expected to pay. I encourage you to do that and have that conversa conversation up front so that you can do one of two things. One, have your child not apply there, okay? If it's just, if there's no way that you're gonna be able to afford it, that's one of the options. The second option is to explain to your child what amount you can pay and if the college does not come through through grants, scholarships, financial aid, everything else, if it, they cannot meet that amount, then that <coughs> school would not be available to your child. Okay, and so to please have those conversations earlier because we are finding ourselves having some tough conversations with, with families and are really unable to help them um, we don't, we, don't, we don't have any magic wand when it comes to finances at colleges. Uh, I have two in college uh, myself, and <laughs> there was no magic wand. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm feeling the pain. So uh, please have those conversations. Um, a few other things to talk about. I, uh, uh, colleges are getting from us and from your child on their application a list of the courses that they're currently enrolled in in senior year. That's a part of the common application to list those courses. It is also going on the transcript. So when we send a transcript to a college for a student, it lists all their previous courses and the current courses that they are enrolled in this year. And students are being admitted and evaluated based on the courses that they are currently in. So we need your child to be 100% confident that the courses that they are in and they list on their application are the courses that they stay in throughout their senior year. 
this is what happens. Your child goes through the early action, early decision process. It's mid-December. They get accepted <coughs> to a few schools. They feel fabulous, okay? They kind of know where they're going, right? So January comes along, and it's the end of the second quarter, beginning of the second semester, and they say, I don't need to take drawing and painting next semester. I've been accepted to college. I kind of just had that on my schedule to be a filler. And they come to us and they say, I'd like to drop that class. And we say, no. <laughs> you have been admitted to a college or university based on the courses that we have listed for you and that you have self-reported. So for you to drop a class at this point, you need to notify or we need to notify the college that there has been a change. And we don't want there to be a red flag for any reason, okay? So what we're asking you is to work with your child before they send out any application that they feel very confident that they are going to stay in the courses that they have listed, okay? And then kind of just a last, a last thing that I wanted to talk about, and it's more of a trend that we're seeing in, in guidance and, and in all high schools across uh, the US, I believe, is the idea of early decision, okay? An early decision is a binding agreement, okay? If your child is applying to a school early decision, it means they're applying to one school and one school only early decision. If they are accepted, they must attend. Okay? So it is for that student that knows 100% without a doubt this is where they want to be. They love it. It offers so many of the things that they want, and they just really want to seal the deal and let that college know that above all else, this is where I want to be. And we have students you know, who use early decision each year. If you would ask me, I would say it's my 18th year, 12, 13, 14 of the years that I've been here, I would have said to a student who was applying to an early decision school and was not quite there with the requirements, okay? So it was ED, was really gonna give them a little bit of a bump in order to get in. I would have said, you know what, that's fine, okay? You're probably gonna be fine in the process. Okay? But over the last few years, we have found that those students have struggled to get their ED uh, decision as an acceptance, that they have at times been altogether rejected after ED, and in some cases deferred to the regular applicant pool. Okay? And this has a lot to do with the sheer number of students who are applying to college, which has just increased, inc increased, and increased. Okay. You also have a large number of international students who are applying to college who um, oftentimes can pay 100% um, of, the, of the tuition and costs. Okay. So the competition is very real. And for a college that has the highest percentage of applications in a given year um, of students ever applying to their school, they are very comfortable saying, we will defer that early decision student to the regular applicant pool and compare them against our regular applicant pool because we want to see where they stack up. They have the luxury of doing that, and we know that they are doing that. And for our students, uh, to feel like they've been successful oftentimes when they are not admitted early decision and they have to be in that regular applicant pool are not feeling like they're getting as many options uh, of the options that they would have liked um, in the regular applicant pool. So what does that mean for us? I think it means that we really need to take a look at the early decision school that your child is considering applying to and make sure that it is not one that is a far reach for them. That it is rather a school that they are a good fit 
or it's a target school for them, that they would be very happy and that it feels like it would be a very good fit on a number of different levels. It is a student that is using early decision, if they want to, for that school that is feeling as if they were more successful in this process, rather than a student who tried to reach a little bit, maybe was deferred or denied, and now just feels like they're kind of floundering in the regular applicant pool because they feel like they're starting from scratch. So I would strongly suggest that your child meet with their counselor. They all have to anyway. That is one of the things that we are going to be looking at with your child to make sure that that early decision school, if that's something that they're choosing to do, and not all students do, but if they are choosing to use early decision, that it is a wise one, um, that they understand the consequences of potentially not being accepted, early decision or deferred to the regular applicant pool, and they are comfortable with that strategy, okay, and they could potentially be in it for the long haul through the end of April, um, having to go through the regular applicant pool. Okay. And that is sort of a new trend uh, that we're hearing about and we're, we're sensing. And I, I just want to end with, at the end of last year, a number of us, of us were at the colleges and universities offer events for counselors towards the end of the year, and they like to give us kind of the overview of what they saw amongst their applicants and talk about trends and really kind of just partner with us as counselors. And we were struck, uh, the counselors and myself, at a few different of these events, how admissions counselors, I'm talking, you know, Georgetown and Vanderbilt and Stanford, uh, Brown, were telling us that these kids are polished, and that is the word that they used. They said that they've never seen applications so well done, no errors, never a spelling error, and that their choice of coursework, how they're spending their free time, and uh, their, their passions, their interests, and their activities, and their recommendations were so well tied in. Uh, they really felt that it was remarkable and making it very hard for them to figure out who would be the best fit at, at their school. I say that not to scare you, but I say that to paint a very real picture of what, of, what is going on in the U.S. Um, as far as applications to colleges and universities, and it may take us partnering a bit more to figure out what is really the best thing for your child, given who they are, what they want out of this next step of their life, and um, really putting them on a track where they're going to have a lot of opportunities um, um, after high school. So. Thank you. We'll put our hands together to rejoin us. Let me ask some questions. Come on over, Kira. Join us here at center stage. Let me ask a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. tell, the, tell the parents what early decision is versus early action, if you could add sure. the early action piece. Sure. So early decision, as I described, it's one school. Uh, you, uh, it's a binding agreement. As a parent, you sign off on it, the student signs off on it, and the counselor has to sign off on it, that we all understand that you must go to that school if you've been accepted. Early action is, uh, has a similar deadline around November 1, November 15th, but it is non-binding. Non so a student will find out mid-December if they've been accepted to the school, but they don't need to commit. They could go through the regular application process, see what other schools they've been accepted to, and make a decision um, by, um, in, in April. April Thank April. you. Kira, tell the parents what rolling admissions is from your experience at RINAC and from Mayapac, because it's the same everywhere. Right, rolling admissions is there's no specific deadline, except you want to get your application in as soon as possible. So as soon as they have all the pieces of the application, they will look and they will um, examine your the application. Indiana, right? Yeah, Very Indiana. Very popular here? Yep. yep. Indiana is a rolling admissions school. Yep. So in other words, by the time 
they have everything complete, they will roll out the decisions. They're not just waiting until a deadline to let you know. So students can find out periodically throughout the year. So the question is, if, if your child applies early decision, do you also put in all of your other applications at the same time? Typically students will do all the applications that have around a November 1 or November 15th deadline. So for example, they're applying one early decision, for early action, everything has to be in by November 1. Those usually all go out at the same time. And then they work on the other applications, the regular decision applications, get those ready, and then depending on how those decisions fall out, they might submit the other applications. So it's like a continuous process. It's a continuous process, yeah. Well, I had another, that's a great question and answer, and I'd add another scenario. Imagine your daughter or son applies early decision and they're deferred by December 20th. What we recommend strongly is the child, mom and dad, back in the counselor's office in early January. In light of that deferment, do we kick off another college search? Not as extensive as the first one, but Christina, Greg Parolo or Gary McCarthy may recommend a couple of schools be added than regular admission in light of that moment. We keep counseling right till the end. We even do wait list counseling where the deposit is due at school A, May 1. Child may be their dream school, they're on the wait list. Christina and the gang will keep counseling through the summer if necessary. Have, it's rare, but it does happen yeah, but, once in know, a while. It's, it's a trickle-down effect, so some of these don't come in until uh, after graduation. So we do host colleges and universities pretty much straight through uh, December at this point, and they're coming here to give information about their school, to possibly um, hear questions and, and hear from our students. Almost all of them will have a card that a student must fill out and they, uh, for the colleges that track interest in a school, uh, it would be important for a student to show up if they could and to say that they were there. Um, uh, but mostly it's just kind of to get the word out about their school and it, it's an opportunity for a student who can't make it to campus to maybe have kind of that one-on-one -on -one and learn a little bit more about the school uh, right here at Byron House. I'd add to that, What's the phrase we use? It comes from hip hop or ESPN. We have to show them the love. Yes. <laughs> All right? Yeah. At my age, don't try to speak hip hop. It doesn't work well. <laughs> as much as your daughter or son may want to go to Lafayette or SUNY Binghamton or Yale, you have to show them that. And this isn't written anywhere, probably. Mm -hmm. Counselors will say it. Visit. If it's fairly close, visit twice. And again, see, to direct to the question, see the rep, even if you stop in for five minutes just to see him for the fourth time. Mm -hmm. To really show interest in the schools is critically important. Tulane, if you don't visit a 4.6 GPA, which is perfect, a 36 ACT, perfect. The perfect child, which doesn't exist, will be rejected. <laughs> and that's just one example of a college that wants, you have to visit New Orleans. 140 schools annually visit. How do you know about it? It is on our door today. It's on Naviance and it's on our website. But this is a fluid environment. If you look on our website or door, you won't see Columbia on October 2nd. Columbia's request only came in over the weekend. You'll have to go to Naviance to find Columbia. So given it's fluid, I would suggest Naviance is the best place to look for these 140 visits. Most of the colleges and universities, once a student applies, they're going to reach out to a student and say, here's information, create a portal with us. Okay, it's through an email. And the portal becomes something that you can check once, twice, or 50 times a day. It all depends. 
and you can see what is updated. SATs are now there, teacher recommendations are now there, and you can kind of keep track of what's still missing or if the application is complete. And that's also um, ways in which some of the colleges and universities will actually distribute their decision uh, is through this portal. For the most part, there are still a few schools that don't do that. Uh, we'll contact either by email and even notify actually in the mail for the packet, but very few these days. Colleges are not looking to dismiss children simply because a box has not been checked. So they'll be informing the child and us, item A, B, or C is missing with no assessment of blame or fault. Uh, they're very good like that. So anytime you're worried about something missing, just call the counselor. Mm -hmm. But chances are good, it's excellent, it's there, it just hasn't been uploaded yet. So deferred means, um, for example, a student applies early decision or early action, one's binding, one's not, and they find out in mid-December that the college is not going to deny them. They just want to defer the decision to the regular applicant pool. So they're going to say, we understand you applied early decision here. We are now making you a regular applicant in our regular applicant pool. So that just means they have to wait that whole time. Um, they might usually want uh, second quarter grades, third quarter grades, uh, anything that's changed with a student. Um, and they might just want some more information before they make the decision. Okay, and then wait list comes at the end of April, when the colleges need to let you know uh, your decision, they might say, we are still really interested in you, but we've already accepted our students. And sometimes our yield, the percentage of students who are going to accept coming to our school, is leaving us with a number of students that we can still admit because they want to be full. Right? They're a business, they need to fill their capacity. And so at that point, they would say to a student, we have a wait list, would you like to be on it? A student needs to respond to that, yes or no. If they still wanna be on the wait list, as they start to understand their numbers better, if they can pull some students off the wait list, they would notify a student. And that's why that process sometimes will go into May, June, and at other times over the summer. Not all colleges have early decision and early action. Some colleges will just have early decision and not have early action. Some will only have early action and not early decision. And then some colleges will have early decision and early action. So uh, given that, I think the hierarchy is you're most committed if you're going to apply early decision and you are number one, I don't care about any other school, this is where I want to go. Of course, a college wants to know that. So that, I think, carries the most weight. But I think early decision is um, a close second because it really requires early action. Early, action uh, early, sorry, early action is a close second because it does require students to be on the ball early enough and to know that this is a school that they are very much interested in, interested in enough that they would like a first read before a regular pool is in place. And so I do think it does carry some weight and, and uh, a lot of our students do apply early action. Early action is unlimited, unlimited, um, yeah. So you could apply early decision to one and early action to 10 if they have it. But it's a lot of work from August 1 when the common application became available to November 1. So sometimes it's really not realistic for all of our students to apply early action to all the schools if they want to go to. So restrictive early action, uh, you may not apply early decision to a school that has restrictive early action. What they're basically saying is it's not binding, you don't have to come to us, but we don't want you applying early decision to any other school. But you can still do early action. But you can still do early action to other schools. Let me add a political statement, if I may. Not in terms of conservative or liberal ideology, but political as it relates to your children. If you think about it, early decision, early action, restricted at Yale, it's not in the best interest of your children. 
it is in the best interest of the university. They want to know who's they, the president, the CFO, the board of trustees at a high-end school wants to know with a high level of certainty by January 10th, 15th, how many hard deposits do they have for the incoming freshman class? Now, if you go back to your own college careers and the <coughs> college careers of your older brothers, sisters, and even parents, April 1 knowing sufficed. May 1 deposits sufficed. But too many schools got burnt with the fiscal year beginning July 1 and such a late deposit <coughs> date. So this is in the interest of the university. They will market it, it's in the interest of your child. Just smile. Don't get in a debate, by the way, <laughs> knowing that it's not in the best interest of your child. There's the political statement. How to do it. Mm -hmm. They gotta know the truth. Uh, the notification of your school counselor, okay, that you intend, as a senior, to make um, an application to a college that is early, early decision, early action, or rolling. What this means, and we are going to talk to your child about this tomorrow, in no way means that your child needs to be done with their application by September 17th. What it means is that we would like to know either in an email or in person that your child is considering applying early decision or early action and that we need, as a counselor, to start getting all of our stuff ready for that child to have everything out the door by November 1st. And I'll add to that too, all of our deadlines are soft deadlines. If your child's not ready by Monday to declare ED, let the counselor know and kick the can down the road. It may require more discussion, more debate, another visit. Just as long as they've reached out to us and indicated something in some way, then we can start to, to know and work through a process with that, with that student. So early decision two is again early decision. So it is, is a binding agreement. It comes after the early decision one um, decisions have been handed out. It gives students an opportunity if they were unsure about early decision one at the time that those applications were due and needed more time to figure it out and want to apply early decision two, or for some students still apply early decision one to a particular college, get either deferred or denied, and there was a really close second and a college has early decision two and now they want to apply that way. Again, um, at that point, you are applying regular decision to all your other schools and possibly early action, but if you are accepted early decision to, again, it is binding and you must go. When are those deadlines, uh, January 15, typically, and a much shorter turnaround time. So you're not going to wait on that early decision, uh, decision until April. It's probably coming somewhere in February. Smaller, smaller numbers apply to ED2. On that note, let's give them a round of applause. Thank them. You guys are, wow, great job. Uh, we also have no rules. Feel free to leave when you need to. I know you have many responsibilities, both professional and personal. We have a couple of more items, if I may. Uh, number four, some important upcoming events. We're not going to go through all of these. They're in chronological order. For example, next week I'll be writing to the parents of freshmen, inviting them to our freshman parents' night. And it's much more extensive than today. I also like to invite three or four weeks in advance and send a reminder two or three days before. It's a busy world. Sometimes you need a nice reminder. So upcoming events for our department are listed. If you go to the back page, number five, please feel free to submit agenda items for future meetings. You can call me, see me at Taza, see me at Nick's, I'm telling you on my places, the Chico's, in the produce aisle. You can say, Mike, I got a really good idea for a guidance discussion topic. And I promise you, if not the next meeting, the meeting thereafter, it will be there. Our admissions numbers this year are outstanding.
They were better than the previous two. I'm speaking overall. Uh, in the 11 years I've been here, we went from 62% of our seniors being accepted to tier one and two schools, and now we're at 80%. So as a school, as a community, you at home, or teachers in the classrooms, or theater folks doing their thing, or coaches doing theirs, and most importantly, your children, our students, really have done remarkable work to make that happen. So the admissions numbers were, were very, very strong. And I, now, are we ever going to get to 100% of all of our seniors accepted to the top 200 colleges in America? No. We know that's not a realistic goal, but the numbers continue to climb, and the class did well. By the way, when we don't do well, I'll give you an example. Two years ago or three years ago, you Penn shut us out. Don't hold me to two or three, but it was two or three years ago. I can go look it up. I talked to Dr. Bill Donahue, <laughs> our former superintendent, Dr. Jen Lamia, who's our current superintendent, Dr. Tim Kultenecker, our deputy superintendent, Chris Passari, Chris Walsh, and I called up UPenn. And I had an hour meeting on the phone with several of their senior folks. And then when their rep came to visit, I got them a nice latte from Taza. <laughs> Somebody called it the bribe coffee, it wasn't. It was just being polite. But putting the kidding aside on behalf of the community, I made it very clear that this is an unacceptable position. And the next year they accepted three. Now that, you might say, Mike, that's not such a big deal. It is when you're talking about Ivy League. So anytime things are not going well, we, we immediately analyze the data and call somebody and meet somebody. One summer, 45 years ago, I spent five hours on the Princeton campus basically saying, are you ever going to take another Byron Hill student? That was on a, some August date. I tied it into a vacation in New Hope. But the main purpose was to spend five hours at Princeton with a lot of folks to get the point across that this is a high quality school with great students. So we do use different interventions. So on behalf of Chris Walsh, our faculty, our school counselors, I want to thank all of you for coming. The next meeting's in the agenda, and we hope to see you in a month and a half. Thanks again.